Hello, good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Welcome you all to Cardiff Chinese Christian Church English Service. And today, of course, I will also say a very happy Chinese New Year to you all. Well, as a Christian, I'm, I'm not going to uh, greet you or give you the blessing regarding the horoscope or zodiacs of the Chinese New Year. But as a Christian, what I will do instead is, of course, I will say, may the grace, may the peace, may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. So now let us have our online greetings. Please have your mobile phone ready. Go to our church WhatsApp group and to send our greetings to each other. And for today, maybe you can also send a happy Chinese New Year to uh, everybody. Okay, let's put our phone down and prepare our heart and mind to praise and worship our God. And this morning, I would like to read from Psalm 66. Psalm 66, verses 1 to 4. Verse 1, it says, Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Let's all bow down our head and pray. Dear Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we come before you with uh, a gratefulness and we come before you with praises, Lord, for you are most worthy of all our praises. So God, we pray therefore, as we come, we sing songs, uh, we, may we come with a grateful heart. When we come to really give all the glories to you, Lord, despite of what is going through in our life, but God, we still come before you to worship you. So Lord Jesus Christ, in you we trust and in you we dedicate this following time. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to read the Apostles' Creed together and then I will pass up time to our worship team. Let us read the Apostles' Creed together. Ready? One, two, three. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hi everyone, hope you're keeping well and safe, and a very happy Chinese New Year to you all. Before we start today's worship, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sunday. We thank you for protecting us during lockdown. Continue to encourage us strengthen us and help us to stand firm and hold on to our faith during these difficult times. And we pray that you will speak to us through your message today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all rise as we come to worship the Lord together. God of Ages God of Ages Bringing glory here You are good You are good Son of Righteousness You are all I see With all my heart Giver of life, giver of life, hope for the lost is in you. All of the earth shines with your light, your glory. You are the God who lives, you are the God who lives, you are the God who heals, you are my hope, my end. Promise and 
your faithfulness I will trust all my days King forever Great in majesty Be glorified Giver of life Giver of life Hope for the lost is in you All of the earth shines with your light Your glory You are the God who lives You are the God who lives You are the God who heals You are my hope, my everything You brought salvation Offer your peace to the earth You are my Lord, my everything I'll trust in you I'll trust in you I'll trust in you I'll trust in you With all my heart I'll trust in you I'll trust in you I'll trust in you I'll trust in you With all my heart You are the God who lives You are the God who heals You are my hope, my everything You brought salvation Offer your peace to the world You are my Lord, my everything You are the God who lives You are the God who lives You are the God who heals You are my hope, my everything You brought salvation your peace to the world. You are my Lord, my everything. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever sing. Of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me. With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Worthy of every song Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus' the name above every other name Jesus' the name above every other name Jesus' the only one that could ever sing 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We sing it holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not. And fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me. With your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Hearts are open. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Shout, be your anthem, your renown. Fill the skies. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let your word move in power. What's dead come to life? We are here for you. We are here for you. To you, our hearts are open. To 
You are hearts so are open, nothing here is hidden. You are a one design. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down to your hearts are open. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are a one design. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. To your arms, and oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world, forever. You are more. You are more. You are more than my words would ever say. You are Lord. You are Lord. All creation will proclaim. You are here. You are here. In your presence I made home. You are God. You are God. All our else I'm letting go. I'm running to your arms, and oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. 
nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world, forever reign. My heart will sing. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus. Jesus, and oh, I'm running to Your arms. I'm running to Your arms. The riches of Your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to Your embrace. Light of the world. Forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world. Forever rain. Now it's time for offering. Offering are for Christians to give back a portion to God. If you need the church bank details, please contact Kobe Chan. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the offering monies. We thank you for everything that you have provided for our lives, all our needs. And um, thank you for your blessings, Lord. And we pray that you just give the church council the wisdom to use the monies wisely. For the further expansion of your kingdom, in Jesus' name, Amen. Now it's time for Bible reading, and shortly after that, Pastor Peter will share God's word. Today's Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-eight to thirty-two. The parable of the two sons. Verse twenty-eight. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, "Son, go and work today in the vineyard." "I will not," he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son, and said the same thing. He answered, "I will, sir," but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, "Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His word." Hello, brothers and sisters and friends. As we come、uh, to study the Word of God, let us start with a word of prayer. Let us all bow down our heads and pray together. Let us pray. Dear God, dear Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you again, Lord. As we're going to open your Word to study your Word, we ask and pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be with us, that you will grant us wisdom coming from you, so that we may understand the parables that we're going to look at today and also find its application in our daily life. So God, we dedicate this following time into Your hand. We give thanks and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we are carrying on from our current study of、uh, 
Christians living in this world is uh, what is the role that we have? What is the role, the plan and the expectation that God has for us? And in this uh, theme of Christian living in this world, last week we looked at we are a friend, that we are a friend of Jesus Christ, and which also equally means is Jesus Christ is our friend. But then last week we look at and we study, we say, well, this understanding of the friendship we have with our Lord Jesus Christ is in fact quite different from the one that we may have with our friends in this world. Because for us, when we say we have friends in this world, the friendship, a lot of time we think about things such as equality, for example, meaning um, our friends and I, I will do my stuff, they will do theirs, as long as uh, things work out together fine, then we will remain friends. We may share our common interests, our common hobbies. However, on the other hand, when things uh, don't go uh, well together anymore, when we start having arguments or disagreements, then the friendship itself can be easily um, ended, like we part ways, we stop being friends uh, altogether. However, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, last week we learned, well, when Jesus said he is our friend, and we are his friend, um, this is something very unique and different. Because what we learned last week is, it is that, in fact, it's Jesus Christ as the king, the heavenly king himself, treating us, his closest attendant or servant, as his friend, someone he trusts and someone he even confides in. So it is such an honor and privilege. And therefore, in response, we should therefore learn to honor our friendship with Jesus by obeying, by following his commands, bringing glories to his name. So let us continue to learn how to be true friends of Jesus Christ. And this week we're going to move on to yet another role that uh, God has for us while we are still living as Christians in this world. And today's role it is a true believer. So we as Christians in this world, is, we are a true believer. A true believer is not just simply saying I'm a true believer of Jesus Christ, that means uh, when I pray my uh, conversion prayer, when I ask Jesus Christ to forgive my sins, to become my Lord and Savior, that prayer was a genuine one. Hence, I am a true believer, disciple of Jesus. Yes, that is one aspect of it. But today, we will also focus on the sort of the implication. Because when I say, or when we say we are a true believer of Jesus, it is like we are an ambassador. We are representing Jesus Christ. We are representing the truth about Jesus Christ. So we, as true believers, it is we are a person of truth, integrity, and credibility. And the passage we're going to look at, it is a parable recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter, chapter 21, which will further on uh, teach us what does it mean to be a true believer, a believer with uh, uh, integrity and credibility. Now today's parable uh, passage is the Matthew chapter 21. It is a parable of two sons. And let us not be confused uh, with the other parables of the prodigal sons as uh, described in Luke chapter 15, because the parable of the prodigal son, as we all know it, they also have two sons uh, mentioned in there. But we are not talking about the prodigal son of Luke 15. We are here in Matthew chapter 21, is the parable of two sons. In fact, this parable is kind of like a mini series in itself. It is one of the three parables that Jesus uh, gave out, spanning from Matthew chapter 21, like our chapter, our passage, all the way to Matthew chapter 22. So these three parables, they kind of like uh, together, they were uh, given by Jesus to address directly to the Jewish leaders who refused to believe in Jesus Christ. And the other two remaining parables were the parable of the tenants and the parables of the wedding banquet. Both of which, as I mentioned, you can easily uh, read them in Matthew 21 all the way to Matthew chapter 22. And once again, all these three parables, they share a common theme. A theme of describing how these Jewish leaders, they were treating Jesus Christ as well as their uh, disbelief, their unwillingness to accept and believe in Jesus Christ. 
And for us, our parable of the two sons, for us to understand the context, another way of putting it is for us to understand why Jesus even gave out this parable. For us to know the background, the context, we will need to go back a little bit further back is Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. There we will be given uh, the background, a bring, like leading up to our parable. So I will read from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. In verse 23 of Matthew chapter 21, it says, Jesus entered the temple court, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Verse 24. Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it and, um, among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. Verse 27. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So as you can see, the context here is the chief priests and the elders, they were challenging, questioning the authority of Jesus. And in that conversation, John the Baptist is being brought up because back then John the Baptist, a lot of people knew about him. A lot of people were following him and especially the crowd. They were all sort of acknowledging the authority of John the Baptist. They were all agreeing that John was definitely a prophet sent by Lord God Almighty. So in this conversation, as you can see, the Jewish leaders, they were scared of the crowd. Of uh, uh, um, That's why they were kind of like stuck in between when Jesus asking them back. So what do you think? You ask me by what, whose authority? Likewise, I ask you, what about John the Baptist? But for us beside John the Baptist, the main underlying theme that's going on here, which carries on, like carries over into our uh, passage of today, is this. The Jewish leaders, while they were on one hand challenging Jesus Christ, they were challenging the authority of Jesus Christ, one side they're doing it, but on the other hand, at the same time, they somehow, they knew the answer. They knew the answer, but they didn't want. They did not want to say it out. They did not want to acknowledge Jesus and thus confirming Jesus' ministry and authority as the one sent by God himself. So that is the kind of like the, the, the stand the Jewish leaders they had. Very reluctant, unwilling to give the answer out. That is why. That is why Jesus responded by telling them the following three parables, and our passage today is the first of the three. And therefore, through uh, these parables, what Jesus was trying to do, Jesus now is in a very wise manner, Jesus now is going to challenge back these Jewish leaders, making them to give and to say the answer. There is no backing off, there is no running, escaping. Jesus is putting them in a situation whereby they will need to give an answer. The parable or our passage starts from verse 28. In fact, Jesus started this parable in a very interesting way. He didn't just go straight into the storytelling as usual, but he started with an actual question, a question directly aimed at the Jewish leaders. So verse 28, he says, what do you think? meaning the Jewish leaders, because after this, you guys will need to answer to this question. So, so verse 28, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. Verse 29, I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then verse 30, then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Verse 31, which of the two did what his father wanted? 
The first, they answered. So this is the parable. Later on, we're going to focus on the explanation Jesus gave. But now for the time being, we're going to focus on the parable itself and what sort of a spiritual lesson we can learn from it. So looking back at this parable, maybe a quick explanation or summary of this parable. It is basically is there are two sons. The two sons are being asked by their father to help him out, work in the vineyard. So therefore we will understand the role of the father. So the father is the landlord, owner of the family's vineyard. And he was asking his sons to help him out to work in the vineyard. So this is a very, very common setting. And to the listeners, when Jesus was saying these parables, to the Jewish leaders as well as the crowd, like all these people who were present, to everyone who, hear, who heard Jesus saying this parable, they will easily visualize the setting. A typical father owning a vineyard asking his two sons to help him out. So they will all say, okay, what will the son answer? So the first son, the first son said no, but then changed his mind and went. The first son's response by saying no to the father, in fact, as we all know it, it was very rude and disrespectful. In that culture, in that time, it will even be considered as not just only rude and disrespectful, it will be considered as rebellious and dishonoring, totally unacceptable. So when Jesus said this parable, when he mentioned the first son's initial response, say, dare to say no to the father, straight to his face like that, his listeners was immediately boiling up. They will say, how dare he, how dare this first son being so disrespectful and even ungrateful to the father. Because after all, if we understand the whole context, this first son, okay, who was supporting his very own li livelihood? Who was feeding him, giving him shelter, food, clothes to wear, money to spend, etc., etc., etc.? All of that, and yet when the father asked him to simply go into their own family business, because as the first son, you will know one day the inheritance and all of the vineyard will come to him. Even with that, the first son's answer is no. So therefore, the listener, they will immediately say, how dare he, how could he? Very similar to the prodigal son of Luke chapter 15. And there, of course, is not the first son. In Luke chapter 15, is the younger one. That's kind of the opposite side. It's the younger one who, uh, while the father was still there, went to his father, asked for his father's, uh, from his father his inheritance. While his father was still very alive. While the father was still very alive, already asking the money that he would receive when the father died. So we all know how dare he to be so uh, uh, dishonoring, disrespectful. So a similar tone, Jesus was striking there. But then the twist, that is the beauty of it. The twist is, but then he changed his mind and went. So this first son, despite him starting off by being disrespectful, and here Jesus saying, but he changed his mind and went. So this word, uh, this phrase, changed his mind, in its original text, in its original like Greek, there the language being used, or the verb being used is, Meta melomai. Meta melomai, which means to have regrets, to, to have remorse and regret so much so that you would wish the things you've done could be undone. Changes, like, like if I can go back in time, I would do things differently. That is the meaning, that is the essence of it. Hence, for us, it's been translated into English is Hence, he changed his mind and went. So you see this first son, again, despite him starting off in the worst possible manner, disrespectful, dishonoring the father, but there is this sense of regret, remorse, even repentance, making this first son uh, doing a total U-turn to go back, repented, go back and accomplish what his father asked him to do. So this, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, this is the, the, the kind of like the essence, the feeling, 
Jesus wanted his listener to capture when he talked about the first son. And now moving on to the second son, the son who said yes but didn't go. Kind of like a total contrast. Because the second son, when the father approached him asking the same question, can you please go to the field and work and help me out? The answer from the second son reply was, I will, sir. I will, sir. So, sir, again, if we go back to the original text, it is the equivalent of Lord, Master. So, in other words, the second son, when being approached by the father, his answer was, I will, my Lord. I will, my Master. So, by this answer, is meaning the second son was giving full respect, full honor to the father, packaging it nicely, so much so, even again, one more time, back to the listener, when Jesus said this parable, when he went on to the second son, he said, I will, sir, I will, my Lord, the listener will say, yes, that is what a son should or expected to respond back when the father is asking him to help in their very own vineyard. They would expect the son to answer in such a respectful and honoring manner. So there you will see the second son will earn full marks by just merely his answer. His uh, 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 answer meaning his uh, body language, uh, the gesture, the things he put up, he, he, he make other people think of him. Total full mark. Everybody will be full praise of him. To say, that is the kind of son I would wish I would have as well. To immediately say, yes, my Lord, I will follow you. I will uh, obey you. But however, again, the twist. Verse 30, he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. So the second son might have given and said all the beautiful, respectful words, fully well packaged. Everybody kind of cheering for him. But then, when it came to putting words into action, nothing. The second son was found out to be a fake, a hypocrite, saying one thing but doing another. So that, of course, immediately drives to the conclusion of that parable, Jesus asking, therefore, which son did what the father wanted? The obvious answer to the people back then and to all of us today of course, the simple answer is the first son. The first son, although although the first son was not perfect, the first son started off in the worst possible manner, being disrespectful, dishonoring, all of that. But then the key, the important twist in this parable, in this event, in this story is, but the first son, despite starting off badly, had regret, remorse, repentance, which eventually he ended up doing what the father wanted. So here, my brothers, and sisters and friends, this is our first spiritual lesson to be learned in today's passage, in today's parable. Because the lesson is lesson of truth and integrity. This is the straightforward and obvious lesson that immediately comes out. Like even the Jewish leaders, they spotted this one, and hence when Jesus asked them the answer, they just without hesitation, no struggle at all, they can say, the first son. When that is the lesson, truth and integrity. When we say our current theme of sermon, the role of Christians living in this world, and our role that we are learning today is a true believer. We are talking about a true believer, not just whether we were genuine in our conversion prayer, but he's also as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, in our uh, life, lifestyle, the things we say, the things we do, the things we think, and so on and so forth. Are we acting as a Christian with truth and integrity. Simply put is, we keep to our words, we keep to our promises, we keep to our commitment. We won't go about taking things in a sort of a laid-back attitude, sort of a not thinking much of actually how to fulfill the promises, how to keep to our words, to keep to our commitment. Often we hear the saying, we talk the talk, 
and now is the time for us to walk the walk, meaning delivering on what we say. Very often, brothers and sisters, this is our challenge. As I always say, whenever we say it comes to serving God, serving the church, serving each other, holding up a Christian testimony, uh, upholding our Christian principle, in all of that, there are three key criteria or, or uh, 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 virtues or ingredients, components, whatever, however you want to put it. These three key areas, we really need to pray to God, helping us to be able to grow. The first of these three is making ourselves available. Making ourselves available is not just freeing our time slot, but it's, run, it's this commitment, like a total dedication into what we are doing. So that we are full-heartedly into it. Like we're telling the people, like, you have my full attention. Making ourselves fully available. And secondly, is making ourselves reliable. Meaning is we are somebody people can trust. Like when we say something, they will know we will deliver it. We keep to our words, we keep to our promises. We have a Christian principle we uphold that we will not fluctuate and kind of sway and buckle under pressure. That we won't quit at the first huddle and disappear. We make ourselves reliable. People say if so-and-so said it, we know he or she will give their very best. Thirdly, is we make ourselves responsible. Responsible meaning taking responsibility. That we are aware of and we are willing to be held accountable for what we do or what we say. It's not kind of like a hit and run type of thing like, oh, I said something, I've done something, and then, oh, no, don't, don't come back to me, okay? Uh, 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 I'm not to blame, I'm not going to bear any responsibility or liability, and so on and so forth. We need to make ourselves responsible, meaning whatever we say or do not say, or do or do not do, that we will be held accountable. We know we cannot just simply uh, uh, do things without thinking of consequences, and so on and so forth. For brothers and sisters, this is the first spiritual lesson, a lesson of truth and integrity. As a role of a Christian living in this world, we are this ambassador that God Christ sent us into this world to show, to demonstrate to this world what does it mean to be a person of truth and integrity, to be a person that is available, reliable and responsible. Let us find ways of applying this into our life, in your relationship with others, how you handle, how you deal with things, and maybe with your colleagues, with your friends, even with church members, at home, at work, at school. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what kind of a name are, are we building up uh, uh, about ourselves? Meaning, what will other people say about us? Will they say, when they hear our name, they'll say, oh, so-and-so, okay, uh, uh, he or she claimed to be a Christian. They say they are a Christian, but then, wow, you know, when we look at them, the way they do things, the way they handle situation, we just run away from them because they are simply not reliable, not responsible. They just basically just shrunk away from any kind of responsibility and so on and so forth. Let us be clear on this. God put us in this world as a beacon of light. Light of the world, salt of the earth, is yes, it's about pointing all of people, everybody back to the salvation of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we're also here as this ambassador showing people the truth about the kingdom of God. What kind of values do we hold firm and dear in the kingdom of God? So this is the first lesson, as I said, but now we're going to move on. When we look at the final part of today's uh, uh, parable, when Jesus also explains further, that when Jesus tried to put the interpretation in, we shall find out it is still about this message of truth and integrity. But with Jesus' uh, further answer, it will bring us to a deeper level of understanding. Now in the final part of our passage, it is verses 31 to 32. In verse 31, 
Which of the two did what his father wanted? Jesus asked. The first, they answered. And then verse 31, 32, Jesus carry on. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For, God, for John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So now, here in this final part, putting these characters into context, based on the answer given by Jesus in verses 31 to 32, put them then back into the parable. Now the question is, who is the Father in that parable? And the answer is, God, our Heavenly Father, was in fact the Father in that parable. And now the next question, who is the first son then? The one who said no to the father and then repented and changed his mind and went back. The answer is, according to Jesus in verses 31 to 32, who is the first son? The tax collectors and prostitutes were the first son. Tax collectors and prostitutes is representing, okay, is representing those who were deemed or who were uh, treated back then as sinners, unworthy people, the outcast, the rejected, those who will have no way and no hope of salvation. That is what tax collectors and prostitutes represent in those days. So to the listeners of Jesus, when he mentioned tax collectors and prostitutes, immediately they would shrug their frown and they're all away from these unclean people, these sinners. I got nothing to do with them. And now the important one as well, who is the second son in the parable? The second son, according to Jesus' answer, they are the Jewish leaders. And again, the Jewish leaders, they are representing. They are representing those who were thinking. Those who were thinking because of who they were, because of their status, because of their identity, because they will say, we are Jews, we are the elected people of God. If we apply it to our modern day, it will be the equivalent of those who simply say, because I am a Christian, because I call myself a Christian. The Jewish leaders, the second son, also representing those, not only because of the, who they think they were, but also because of the outward appearance. Outward appearance in the sense of um, the, the religious, the spiritual act that people can see. Likewise, in our uh, modern equivalent, it will be uh, when we think, because of what I do as a Christian, that I will go to Sunday churches uh, services, I attend Sunday services, uh, I serve God, uh, I do this, I do that. It's simply because on the kind of like the upfront, like outwardly, you look like a Christian, you act like a Christian. Now the parable gives us this massive slap in the face not just to the Jewish leaders back then, but maybe to many of us today as Christians as well. Because in that parable, who is considered to be the second son? The one who said, yes, my Lord, but didn't do it. It was the Jewish leaders. It was Christians. Not all Christians, but Christians with a certain uh, 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 sort of a characteristics. Now, what is Jesus' message here? Jesus' message through this parable, first of all, if we go back to verses 31 to 32, Jesus said, truly I tell you. So this is again, it's a very strong emphasis, highlighting the importance of what is coming next. And what is coming next? Truly I tell you, Jesus' meaning now, is those who refuse God, those who rejected God, but later, but later repented but later oh, actually obey God, like the first son, like the first son. Those will be the one who will enter the kingdom of God. Those will be the one who belongs to the kingdom of God. But on the other hand, Jesus' message through this parable, but on the other hand, those who say, yes, my Lord, my Lord, but do not obey God. Do not put their words into actual actions. Those, like the second son, 
unless they repent, unless they change, unless they repent and go back to God. Otherwise, they do not get into the kingdom of God. They do not belong to the kingdom of God. So my brothers, sisters and friends, this is the final message that Jesus was trying to convey to us through this parable. It is still a message of truth and integrity as we explored earlier on. But now this integrity that we're talking about, it's going deeper now. It's going more than just what we talk about in our first point of merely uh, uh, putting words in action, keeping to our promises, keeping to our words, keeping to our commitments, be reliable, responsible, all of that while they are true. But now Jesus is also highlighting something more importantly. This integrity we talk about, it is also an integrity in regards to our relationship with God. What I mean by that, integrity in regards to our relationship with God is who is God? Who is Jesus Christ to us? at this moment in time. Another way of rephrasing this question is, what level of importance, what level of priority do we actually currently give to Jesus Christ in our life? So integrity in regards to our relationship with God, it is Christ, our relationship with Jesus Christ, who is he truly, truly to us? in relationship, like in the context of the rest of our life, the various aspects of our life, the different priorities in our life. Where is Jesus Christ? What is the ranking in there? Because integrity, it means in unison. We can't say one thing and then in action it's proven differently. So this means integrity in our relationship with God is if we say we are a Christian, our action will need to match to what we say. So this is our second spiritual lesson here. The kind of like the advanced or deeper meaning of truth and integrity. Because if we say we love Jesus Christ, if we say we are a disciple of Jesus, if we say we are a Christian, then Jesus, Jesus' answer to us, respond to us is, then we will obey, follow his command. That's what Jesus said in John, Gospel of John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14 verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. Further on, in still in the same chapter, John chapter 14 verse 21, Jesus also said, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So here in John chapter 14, Jesus said it very, very clearly. That if you say you are my disciple, if you say, you know, you love me, that you follow me as your Lord, your God, then Jesus said, then keep, follow, my, obey my command, my teaching. Teaching that we can learn from the Bible, from the scriptures. Likewise, Apostle James, we know it very well. In James in the New Testament, he said these following things. James chapter 2, verse 17. Faith by itself, meaning our Christian faith, faith in God. Faith in it by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Still James chapter 2, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deed is dead. So faith without action is there is this very well-known teaching coming from Apostle James. And here he's talking about, as we always explain, he is not talking about salvation earned by our action, salvation earned by our human effort. No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is we, uh, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of Jesus Christ. But however, just like Jesus said in John chapter 14, if we say we have faith in Jesus, we trust Jesus as our God and Savior, then our action needs to back it up. Our action needs to prove, to say uh, what we mean. We need to prove that. Lastly, this is also a passage I quoted many times. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. 
Again, it is from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So brothers and sisters, may we not take these scriptures lightly. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus has very clearly, leaving no options, leaving no ambiguity, to tell us on that day there will be people who will still approach him and say, Lord, Lord. And then Jesus say, who are you? I never knew you. Why Jesus say, I never knew you? Because these people who went to him still saying, Lord, Lord. But they did not. They did not do the will of the Father. That they did not, as all the scriptures are saying, through the actual Christian action to demonstrate whatever they are declaring, like their faith in God, when they say they are Christian, but yet there's no action, no integrity to say what they mean. Jesus said, I never knew you. Go away. You are literally just the second son. You say one thing, but you did the other. So, brothers and sisters, let us be very careful. By merely putting up a Christian facade, meaning just doing things Christians do, but without, without a true inner change by Jesus Christ, without a true relationship with Jesus Christ, be very careful. That is not a saving faith in Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, I would like to finish off by maybe asking ourselves, not you go ask other people, but you prayerfully, you yourself, quiet down, spend some time on your own with Jesus Christ, but you ask yourself these following questions. May God guide you through. So in conclusion, maybe this question. The first one, Again, in regards to maybe our uh, uh, sin, forgiveness, repentance, because going back to that parable, the first son was the son who said no, but then repented. So in regards to that, the question is, do I profess to believe in Jesus? Meaning, do I say I am a Christian? However, I know I still have not really, truly repented of my sin. What do I mean by this question is, is that possible when you say, I am a Christian, but then at the same time, you know in your life, you still have some sinful habits, that you are still unwilling, unrepenting, that you still say, what is wrong with that? Or you're still saying, I am not willing to let go of those. But yet you claim, you say, you are a Christian. Yet you say, Jesus Christ, you are my God, you are my Lord. Jesus, you come and forgive my sin, my repent. Every um, first month, I mean first week of the month, Holy Communion, you still eat the bread, drink the cup, and doing all what I would call it, just like the second son, doing all the religious thing even, if you're not careful. But deep down, there's no repentance. That is what this first question is aiming at. It's not talking about, do you still have sin in your life? Let us be very careful, brothers and sisters. All of us, yes, we still struggle. We are still on this journey, asking our Lord Jesus Christ, by his grace, by his mercy, to help us to overcome our temptation, to overcome our sin, maybe step by step. But what I'm again asking this first question, I need to explain clearly, is about the lack of repentance totally saying on one hand i am a christian but on the other hand sin is still kind of like raging in my life and i say it's fine i don't feel there is a need to change that is what i am asking and not about those who are already acknowledging the sin confessing the sin and it's by the grace and power of jesus christ helping us to repent step by step that is not what i'm asking okay i'm that let I really be clear. Secondly, secondly, along this side is also, the question is, 
Do I claim to be a Christian, but yet do not follow God, Jesus Christ, in obedience? What I mean by this question is, can we say I am a Christian, but yet in my life, in my decision making or anything else in my life, okay, I just don't follow God at all. I don't even care what is God's will. I don't even spend time to find out what is God's will, what is God's expectation regarding these certain issues that I am facing, regarding these decisions I am making, and so on and so forth. I, but yet I say I am a Christian. But yet I have no uh, uh, interest at all in finding out and to follow God's command. Let us be careful if that question you find yourself to be in that category. Because finally, finally the question is, where is Jesus Christ currently sitting in this ranking or table of priorities, if I may put it that way? The honest, deep searching question that you ask yourself prayerfully, if, if you ask yourself, where is Jesus Christ currently ranking in the priorities in your life? Your career, your love life, your relationship, your children, with finance or anything else. Will any of these, at this moment in time, be sitting at a higher ranking, at a higher importance in your life than Jesus Christ? Then, my dear brother and sister in Christ, let us be careful, let us be aware. These scriptures are here. The parable of today is here to remind us. Let us be alert. Let us be vigilant. Let us not be the second son who by then will have a nasty surprise awaiting us. When Jesus said, who are you? I never knew you. Let us close with a word of prayer. And let's all bow down our heads and have a word of prayer together. Dear God, we come before you today, Lord, through the parable that you have taught us. One more time to ha help us, to remind us, to be aware, to be careful. Which of the two sons are we? Are we the one that repents and come back to you? Or are we the one who simply say yes to you, but then we didn't do it? Meaning we are really don't put our faith into action. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. May we always uh, be the one that put you at the center of our life, that we truly show we are a Christian with integrity and truth. God, we know this is easier said than done. There will always be plenty of things in our life that will challenge us, that will challenge us of putting them ahead of you, putting them more important than you. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, in those moments Lord, for whenever we are weak, then your grace will be sufficient for, for us. Whenever we are weak, then the power of you, your strength, will be shown through us. So God, in you we trust, in you we dedicate all of this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Let us all stand up and in faith uh, we receive the blessing from above. Let us all stand up and bow down our head. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the eternal love and mercy of our Heavenly Father, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now on till forever. Amen. Please take a seat. This is the end of our Sunday service today after your own quiet meditation or personal prayer. And may I encourage you or invite you to join our online uh, fellowship via Zoom that will start at quarter past 12. So please uh, do take care of yourself and uh, remain safe and we shall see you again next Sunday. May God bless you.
your glory. Your peace. 